There are some videos from Second Thought that I've seen that weren't that bad, but, you know, let's see. The Russia-Ukraine conflict, what is Putin thinking? Let's learn together. He's against the war, though it isn't sussy. Well, if it isn't sussy, then that'll be yet another time that I get to say, oh, the Second Thought video was not as bad as I expected it to be. This episode is made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. Fun fact, this is only the second time I've ever- Oh right, this is from the 5th of March, so this would have been like a week after the invasion? ...released a video late. It's an important topic, and I wanted to cover the conflict from an angle I haven't really seen yet. So I moved some release dates around to get this one out in a timely manner. Anyway, this episode is absolutely gonna get demonetized. So if you appreciate the work I'm doing, please consider becoming a patron on Wait, Patreon. Wait, why? Is Putin crazy? Eh, probably. Most likely, at least a little bit. Does it matter? Also, yes. That's the short answer for this video that's gonna end up being around 20 minutes long. The long answer, well, it's obviously more complicated than that. Let's talk about mainstream coverage of the conflict. Because this situation is fraught and constantly evolving, here's your disclaimer. Hit pause before you start fighting in the comments. And in case you didn't read it, this video isn't going to be defending Putin or Russia. The invasion slash war in Ukraine is unequivocally wrong. You know, I know there's plenty of room to go wrong, but so far I have to say that the first minute of this video is pretty good. We have an initial framing, we have an acknowledgement that the situation is ongoing, and that the video was written earlier than it was released, which means that not all this is going to be up to speed. Uh, I'll give it another minute or two more, let's just see what the direction is. Even if you were to take Russia's rhetoric about NATO expansion at face value, which, yes, NATO has been kicking the hornet's nest for some time now. Ah, uh, well, there we go. Now, this conflict is a dramatic, dangerous, and horrific overreaction. My heart goes out to the people of these two countries who will suffer terribly in a war they did not want. In this episode, I'm going to try and answer a couple of questions. Like the one in the title, Is Putin Crazy? But I'll mostly be looking into why that question gets asked in the first place, how useful it is, both in the short and the long term, and what focusing on that question leaves out of the picture. This video is going to try to understand this whole situation a little bit better without getting into this. To be fair, a ton of leftists changed their rhetoric to be less cringe after the invasion happened. Yeah, a lot. there were a ton of leftists who were like, dude, Russia's not going to invade. The State Department is fooling you all yet again. And then the moment the invasion took place, they're like, uh, 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 well, you know, I mean, the invasion's bad and all. Like, I don't know, NATO probably shouldn't have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we all know. Specific details of the conflict. We are not going to rehash the whole history of Ukraine or Russia. We are not going to go into the details about Euromaidan or Crimea. We're going to look at the way we tell the story of the conflict, not the conflict itself. Significant chunks of this video will be speculative. Most analysis of the conflict is at this time. So take everything I say with a grain of salt, and I invite you to respond to this video and critique it to your heart's content. In any case, this video won't come down on a single conclusion for each topic, but rather put out a couple ideas and leave it up to you to decide what you want to take away. So, let's get back to Putin. Recently, this is the kind of coverage he's been getting. He is just basking in his own hubris. Do you think... Do you think that he has it in him, and Putin in particular, to actually pull that lever, so to speak, or press that button? Well, I personally think he's unhinged. Senator Marco Rubio posted a tweet that uh, caught my attention. He said, I wish I could share more, but for now I can say it's pretty obvious to many that something is off with Putin. He has always been a killer, but his problem now is different and significant. It would be a mistake to assume this Putin would react the same way he would have five years ago. Putin it turns out to be far, far crazier than we had any idea. Because he's a crazy cycle that is now a terrorist, a number one terrorist in the world. This is different. He seems uh, erratic. Uh, there is uh, an ever-deepening uh, delusional rendering of history. For a lot of observers, Putin does seem crazy. And there's some evidence that, in the short term, talking about the Russia-Ukraine conflict by focusing on Putin being crazy has had some advantages. As we've seen, it is one of the factors that has- So, I just want to say, Generally speaking, most theories of international conflict and most like sort of geopolitical frameworks that people apply when acting or when analyzing actions tend to assume rationality on the part of world leaders. Um, that's very necessary for a lot of like these geopolitical frameworks, in part because when you get to a situation where countries have nuclear weapons and they're not being led rationally, you get into really alarmist situations. So Partly for our own sakes, we tend to assume that even if individuals in a country are fucking crazy, countries as a whole have enough 
sort of internal checks and balances to determine that the output of their actions will be sane. They'll be self-interested. So no self-interested country would ever start a nuclear war because it would end the world, stuff like that, you know. Um, the issue is that some countries have more checks and balances than others. And I think it's pretty fair to assume that Putin, given the fact that he's basically the uncontested leader of Russia, a, a the head oligarch with essentially unchecked control within the country, as far as we can tell, um, th there's less limiting his behavior than there is for a person like, say, Trump. Trump is a lunatic, um, but Trump is also limited by a really complicated democratic bureaucracy. Putin isn't. So... I feel like conversations on whether Putin is crazy, if he's rational or not, they're not just like a media tactic. They're actually really, really, really important for how we understand this conflict and how we understand our just broader political framework when it comes to geopolitics. Because if, we, if, if the assumption is wrong, we have to do things differently brought a lot of nations together in supporting Ukraine, leveraging their military resources, economic power, and diplomatic platforms to criticize, deter, and weaken the Russian aggression. At least, that's the hope for the alliance led by the West. The positive outcome being, hopefully, a swift end to the conflict and to the immediate violence on the ground. A negative peace. Both within Russia and in cities all over the world, we've seen protests against the war and against Putin himself. There's no doubt that that kind of public support is justifying and being used as justification for the response to Russia. It is fueling the image of Putin as a deranged maniac that needs to be stopped right away. So far, that framing has been effective in souring public opinion on the conflict and pushing for peace talks, though with some important limitations we'll get to in a second. It should be worth keeping in mind that, generally speaking, the argument that a person is a psychotic warmonger is a pretty common one to frame against people like Putin, you know, like sole dictators who start unjustified wars. It was certainly levied at Bush back after the invasion of Iraq, uh, and it was levied massively against Hitler as well. He was framed as a lunatic, like, all the time in propaganda and media derisions against him. He was framed as a lunatic within Germany before he took over Germany, and all the people who called him a lunatic were killed. Um, and of course, he was a lunatic. However, we didn't have as much knowledge about the mental state of Adolf Hitler back then as we do about Putin today, in large part because we don't have a global network of communication now, or we, we didn't have it back then the way we do now. So in terms of the information that we're working off of, I feel like just it's reasonable to say that, you know, calling leaders crazy when they do these like bloody unjustified wars is uh, fairly par for the course, I think, very often. There's also the nuclear issue. The fear that has been stoked by Putin's escalating rhetoric around nuclear weapons. Specifically, the idea that a deranged Putin could press the button no one with any shred of sanity would ever press has likely contributed to the haste with which bystander countries have pushed for diplomatic resolutions to the conflict. It is incredibly scary to imagine nuclear warfare breaking out, and people know that and will do anything to avoid it. This, again, will hopefully mean a quick return to a negative peace between the two countries, but is of course a net positive for Russian interests, which can leverage this situation for an upper hand in negotiations. That upper hand might force Ukraine to make significant concessions, ultimately giving Russia territorial or other gains without the invading country needing to get them through the more quote-unquote conventional use of total occupation. There is a chance that Putin knows this and is exploiting what's called the madman theory. He is absolutely doing that, 100%. There's no, there's 0% chance that he's not. The madman theory is basically like, if you come across as deranged and unhinged and unpredictable, other countries will treat you with a wide berth, and as a product of that, you can get away with more than you would otherwise. AKA the North Korea, like, for the past, like, yeah, decades, North Korea's, like, main, the way they exist. Yeah, Nixon uh, uh, pulled that shit as well, 100%. Uh, you just want to come off as, like, a, you want... You want to be a little bit like Tuco, okay? Like Tuco from Breaking Bad. Does everyone remember Tuco? Tuco's the, well, Tuco was a madman, but you want to act like Tuco. Um, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, let, me, let me get a picture, Tuco Salamanca. So we all, so we remember, for the people who remember via faces. This guy, you remember? We want to be this. That threatening nuclear warfare is not credible to anybody who rationally balances out the pros, minor territorial, symbolic, and economic victories, with the cons, the annihilation of the human species. So he is purposefully- you shake the page, it comes back? Playing up the image of a madman who can't rationally balance these two sides. Acting convincingly crazy gives him the upper hand in negotiations because it makes nuclear warfare seem like it could be real, even though it is utterly irrational. For the West and Ukraine, this poses a challenge of how to respond to Putin. On the one hand, treating the nuclear threat at face value gets countries to the negotiation table quickly, but on unequal terms. On the other, it makes military support and intervention complicated. 
In one theory, it slows down any sort of Western military action. If Putin is crazy and his biggest perceived threat is NATO, pushing his buttons will lead us straight into nuclear Armageddon, so the West should not intervene. According to another way of thinking, if Putin is crazy, everything is on the table to stop him, so the West has to intervene. The latter, by the way, is the kind of logic that comes up when people are asked how we should deal with terrorists. According to an experiment by Princeton researchers, if test subjects are told that terrorists are bloodthirsty fanatics, maniacs ready to spill the blood of millions of people, they are more likely to advocate for unilateral military responses and, um, removal attempts. When terrorists are presented as rational, they're more likely to advocate for negotiation. These two ideas, the madman theory and the terrorist example- I disagree with this framing because the idea that the West is going to send in troops directly has never been taken seriously in any of, like, the NATO countries. Like, the, the idea that NATO or U.S. intervention is on the table is just not the case. Biden was immediately like, nope. Um, so the implication here is that, like, the, 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 the is Putin crazy framework is going to lead to NATO. Like, NATO isn't susceptible to media framing. I mean, to some extent, but it's not, it's not like the media is not putting out articles to influence NATO Article 5 military decision making. You know, they, they do that on their own and they're not doing it here. People are contradictory. In one theory, being crazy gets you to the negotiation table. In the other, it's being sane that gets you negotiating. The big reason for that difference is nuclear weapons. When you have to factor in the death and... Oh, wait. That's the distinction has been drawn. Now I agree with the video again. Yes, that is correct. If Russia did not have nuclear weapons and didn't have allies with nuclear weapons with which they had shared military agreements, NATO would have already conquered Russia. <laughs> the, 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 the invasion of Ukraine would have lasted four days before the world's largest combined NATO armada would have swept eastward and taken the entirety of Russia. They would have been, yeah, it, w it would have been over in an instant. Um, okay, no, no, the, the video, I think, is presenting a fair point here. Destruction of everyone and everything you love. How you treat an irrational actor is very different. This puts the West and its media institutions in a complicated position. Treat Putin as a madman, and you can justify your role in this war. You can play off the fear and frustration that gets ordinary people to start thinking about what would happen if Putin was <clears throat> removed tomorrow. But it also means you'll Inshallah. have to negotiate against the guy with the upper hand. Treat him like a rational actor who would never, ever detonate a nuclear weapon, and you risk getting it wrong like you did with this invasion. Except this time, the consequence is nuclear annihilation. Because remember that less than a month ago, Putin's threats to invade Ukraine weren't thought of as very credible to many outside observers. Two leftists. <laughs> no, e every, basically everyone was fully on board with the idea that that invasion was going to happen, except for online leftists. That's the, all, that's the only group. Uh. Even for those who warned of Russian aggression, the idea that so much of the country, including Kiev, would be bombed didn't seem likely. Putin knows this. He knows how his unpredictability shapes the responses he gets, and is purposefully leveraging it. That, or he's genuinely deranged. We might never know. I'll give you my thoughts at the end. Overall, treating Putin as a deranged warmonger seems to have been a rough net positive, at least up to this point and in the short term. More important- At this point, you're just stealing content? If I don't have any severe disagreements, I'll ask my editors not to post it, okay? I just- people said it was a bad video, so I'm gonna see the video. Important caveats coming soon. On the whole, it has been a key factor in stopping nuclear warfare from breaking out, assuming that threat was at the very least possible, and it has created urgency around diplomatic resolution, even if on extortionary terms. That is certainly better than the alternative. Nuclear annihilation or never-ending conflict. Unfortunately, the forest might start getting lost in the trees depending on how the rest of this short-term response is carried out. In the scramble to arm Ukraine, Western countries may be creating a new Afghanistan. The West could be arming oh. paramilitary organizations which, once the immediate conflict is settled, could pose an internal threat and would inevitably be used to justify more lethal aid, more interventions, and more imperialist aggression. The kind- Hard disagree. The situation with Afghanistan is nothing like the situation with uh, with Ukraine. Massive disagreement. Um, the like we're, in Afghanistan, we funded the Mujahideen, which were literally like anti-government, like radical rebels. In this case, we're directly funding like the agreed upon democratic, liberal federal government. Like it, it, now, will there be problems with like the proliferation of weapons by like groups within Ukraine after they beat back Russia? If they beat back Russia, yeah. But I don't think it's anywhere near comparable to, like, the Mujahideen. ...and we've seen ravage the Middle East for decades. 
what Western countries see as the most reasonable short-term response, giving Ukraine the means to defend itself against a much more powerful aggressor, may lead to unintended consequences. Or hell, maybe they are intended. I wouldn't be surprised. Consequences that could bring proxy- Wait, 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 why, wait, how do- how does the West benefit from, like, the Azov Battalion running about Ukraine with, with Javelin missile launch systems? Why? Wait, why? We're, we want a strong Ukraine. That's in our geopolitical interest. Imperialist wars back to the forefront of international relations in the long term. There's also a concern that treating Putin like this has actually done the opposite of the escalate to de-escalate strategy, with some still very minor today, but nonetheless present voices calling for a preemptive strike or a full-scale NATO involvement. Again, this is highly speculative. Thinking about the short term with so many competing narratives- There are liberals who are calling for this, but I don't think anyone in government is taking it seriously. You know, I, I just, I, I don't think that. Um, yeah, I just, it's just like tweets. Like, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's not happening, you know. Biden has been very clear on this. And the uncertainty surrounding Putin's mental state leads to an impossible number of forks and alternative histories, many of them terrifying to imagine. When thinking about the long term, then, it may be beneficial to subscribe to a different way of telling history. Instead of focusing on the individual, and therefore subscribing to the great man theory of history, the idea that history is shaped by great leaders above all else, it may be better to understand the conflict from a more institutional, economic, and materialistic approach. A historical materialism of some sort, if that was even a real thing. I've certainly never heard of it. And before we do, just to be clear, focusing Goober. on Putin at a time like this is not entirely wrong. Putin sits at the helm of a country he has profoundly shaped for over two decades. The way Russia acts in most affairs does usually boil down to whatever Putin says, because his status as an autocrat grants him far more decision-making power than any one person should ever have. The point of a historical materialist approach isn't to deny that, but to explain how it is that he gets to have such a strong decision-making power in the first place and- I think the great man theory of analysis only works in so far as you understand highly influential leaders to be the sort of history chosen catalysts and advocates for certain pre-existing historical trends. So have there been great men throughout history in the sense that there have been highly influential individuals who have had a ridiculous amount of like control over the way history took its course? Totally, 100%. But they didn't do that singly. They were champions of a pre-existing historical and material state of affairs. And they happened to be the person who led that force. But it could have been someone else. You know, they were exceptional, but it was, it, it's not so much them creating the wave as riding the wave. Does that make sense? Like they don't, the, the pre-existing force was there. They just happened to be the person at its head. What factors exist that guide and constrain or alternatively give him carte blanche when he's exercising it? At the time of writing, some people are predicting that the heavy costs of sanctions and military operations against Russia will make Putin incredibly unpopular at home and abroad, possibly ending up with him not leading Russia anymore. If that is the case, if Putin does leave office, our fixation on him and him alone may lead to an overconfidence in the stability of whatever peace we hopefully get on the other side. Possible. That is totally possible. Yeah. Just because Putin is out of the picture doesn't mean everything is okay. So our analysis of the conflict must also take into account what will survive after Putin is gone. Let's give that a shot. Thus far, the analysis of the Ukraine-Russia conflict has been done on two big lines. According to the liberal philosophy of international relations, this conflict has been driven by ideas and international institutions. Putin is committed to the idea of a unified Russian identity inherited from the USSR and the greater history of Russian nations. Putin wants Ukraine, or at least part of it, because he is interested in uniting all people who are tied to the Russian identity and history they share. Debates in liberal circles are over the degree to which Ukrainians in the east of the country are really more like Russians, and whether that's sufficient justification for the breach of international law. Usually, in the west at least, their answer is no. The other line of thinking, what is- Oh god, remember this video? So, that line of thinking, the one, the, the liberal analysis here, is correct if you understand how fascism functions. You know? The problem is there are a lot of people- By the way, realism is not historical materialism. I don't know why lefties think that this is any more of a historically realist approach towards international politics than, like, some liberal dog shit. But in this case, the so-called liberal framework is correct because this is how fascism functions. Fascism is extremely identity-based. A lot of people don't, like, lefties seem to think that because their mode of historical analysis is, like, uh, materialist, that means that others are as well. But historical materialism is a lens of analysis. It's not like the way history is. History is history. 
Historical materialism is a way of framing it, but to a fascist, a fascist would never think of history as a historical materialist force, as a, you know, a dialectical emergence of different and competing forces with agitations internally that determine the outcome, so on, you know. Uh, a fascist thinks in broad historical paradigms with great victors and great losers, identities and homelands and birthplaces. They think in the simplistic idealism of a childhood storybook. It's it's very dumb, but that is how fascists tend to think. I mean, listen to them talk. You're not getting historical analysis from them. Um, not materialist historical analysis at the very least. So the idea, like, is Putin doing this ideologically? Like, is he doing this because he wants to reunite the Russian Empire? Well, yeah. I think that strong men, generally speaking, want to cement their power and create a historical framework by which they're to be remembered through promoting the xenophobic idealism, which is endemic to fascist empires, you know? Like, ask, like, like, seriously, give me a rational materialist analysis for why the Holocaust happened in Nazi Germany. You're not going to be able to. Well, it was in the material interests of the, no, it wasn't. It was in the ideological interest to create and then to exterminate an interior political enemy. And clearly it didn't even end up being in their interest because they all fucking lost and we ended up hanging all of them in The Hague. Um, uh, in the Nuremberg trials, you know. Um, so I just think it's important to understand that different systems will have different methods of analyzing and appreciating their own motives. What is usually called the realist philosophy of international relations, sees this conflict in terms of military power and influence. Russia is invading Ukraine to keep the country as a barrier to NATO expansion. I really, really, really need to debate this guy. This idea is so fucking stupid. Also, like, the idea that countries have regional spheres of influence is wrong now. Countries have international spheres of influences. Do you think there's a part of Earth that... The idea of regional spheres of influence hasn't been a thing for hundreds of years. Like... England and France were sworn enemies for millennia, but England had colonies all over the world. The idea that it's like, oh, you can avoid conflict by letting empires control their neighbors because that's within their regional influence, but they totally won't go after other countries outside of that regional influence. Yes, they will. And they have. They have for like the past forever. <laughs> we just go, go look at Macedonia. Go, go, go look at ancient Greece. The, the, the idea that they'll like stop arbitrarily at their nearby countries is just not true. It's not true. It's just dumb. And the threat of being undermined by a strong military at its borders in the future. Likewise, the realist analysis on the other side is that Russia is taking over Ukraine to expand its own influence and destabilize the EU. Debates here are about what threat NATO or Russia actually poses in terms of influence and military power. While there is an element of truth to both these philosophies, especially because different political leaders are desperately trying to make either one seem more true by acting as if it was, the third, less popular approach to this conflict is through the Marxist analysis of international relations. Oh, thank God he distinguishes the realist and the Marxist analysis. That's the historical materialism I mentioned earlier. This analysis tends to focus on the way in which economics and economic institutions play a role in explaining this war and more generally sees economic motivations as the foundation upon which politics generally and liberal and realist philosophies more specifically can play out in the first place. For what it's worth, by the way, I don't think this analysis works at all for Russia in its current situation. Uh, I just don't. If, if, the, if the powers that be in Russia wanted to make as much money as possible, the oligarchs that actually make decisions would just like capitulate to neoliberalism and allow for reforms within their country while maintaining their economic leadership and continue to make billions off the privatization of the post-USSR economy. Like right now what they're doing threatens their status quo. It threatens their, their, their bottom dollar. But you know, if they really wanted to like, there are things they could have done to, to like mainline the Russian economy, just been like a, you know, Kind of like China. Well, China is way more rational in its attempts to achieve its goals than Russia is. Russia is, I think, a uniquely incompetent cr country when it comes to achieving their apparent goals. Um, if we're talking about like massive wealth for the oligarchs, why would they start a war that would get them sanctioned the world around? You know, if they were, um, if we're talking about like geopolitical power, then why did they like? 
break apart from the militarily superior like NATO bloc after the fall of the Soviet Union and continue to ostracize themselves? Like, why didn't they open up their trade markets? Why didn't they do like what Norway or Saudi Arabia did, where they become like an oil magnate for the rest of the world while maintaining, you know, their own like internal, like, you know, like build, like system buildup. Norway is far more democratic than the Soviet, or sorry, than um, Saudi Arabia, but like they could have done so much, but like they, they didn't. Because they're really inefficient and really corrupt and really poorly run. Sorry. Each theory is basically competing about which one comes first, not really about which one gets it right. They all kind of get part of it right in one way or another. Marxists see I respect that acknowledgement that different frameworks could be useful in different ways. See this conflict as being the consequence of an accumulation of economic and political power into a few hands. Following the fall of the USSR, the liberalization of Russia was dominated by the privatization of industries previously under state control. In their place, oligarchs who were either well-connected in the former USSR or exceedingly capable of navigating the newly liberalized economy consolidated major sectors of the economy, notably fossil fuels, into their very few hands. Thanks to this concentrated economic power, they were- How do they compare to North Korea? I think that North Korea is more competently run is more is more competently run than Russia. I genuinely do. North Korea has nothing. They have nothing. And with nothing, they achieve their apparent national goals of keeping other countries from conquering them uh, through madman theory. They clearly don't give a fuck about their people or whatever. Yeah, the whole Jucha, Jucha self-reliance bullshit or whatever. It's it seems like if they're if they if if the if the leaders in North Korea just want to have like a permanent totalitarian like misery state where they're in charge, and that seems to be like their major goal, because they don't seem to have like actionable ambitions outside of that. They're achieving it competently. Um, but they have nothing, you know? Russia had the potential to have something. Uh, Ru like, it seemed like if Russia's goal, like what is Russia's goal? Like it's just, whatever they're doing, it's not working for them. With what North Korea has, what they've been doing has been working for them. People in chat are interpreting what I've said as North Korea is a better country. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's more more competent at achieving its apparent goals. No word did I say its goal is feeding its people, okay? I think its goal is just to maintain a totalitarian state without, without being conquered. And to that extent, I think they have very little, but have done well to achieve those goals given how little they have. Russia had the potential to be a continued world superpower, and they didn't. They fucked everything up. And they're continuing to fuck everything up. They were able to have a high degree of influence on politics, carrying Putin and his support for their endeavors into the highest office, from which he could carry national economic policy in a few key directions, specifically to enrich his buddies while they both kept one another on a tight leash. I can't believe he looks like this, by the way. I can't believe this is, like, acceptable for Russia. That you can, like, it's allowed, like, in a post-television era. It shouldn't be surprising that this is an unstable economic system, especially given how central a few key, non-renewable resources are to the whole operation. Unlike the countries to its west, Russia did not benefit from a Marshall Plan that would have bolstered its capitalist economy within a strong network of cooperation with the big daddy of global economics, the US. Russia's privatization and primitive- That's true, by the way. That was bad. That was bad of us. Accumulation came with all the pitfalls and punishments of liberalism unadulterated, creating a punishing austerity for the general population, but lucrative profits for a few at the top. This allowed for and promoted a single figurehead with visions of expansion at its helm. Because when domestic crises begin in a capitalist society, they'll often turn towards nationalism and look at outward expansion for solutions. Of course, Russia isn't in a vacuum. While all this is happening, Ukraine is modernizing its agriculture and energy sources, cutting off Russian gas slowly, taking its role as a channel for Russian gas for the rest of Europe slowly off the table, and proving the value of its rich black soil, an incredibly fertile ground and a major source of profit. These are trends that Russian oligarchs have kept an eye on for a long time, threatening their profits the further away Ukraine gets from them and a big reason to keep courting Ukrainian politicians. And look, I may not have all the details. Like most of you, this wasn't- this is, this is true. I think you could make an argument that this might be a purely economic decision with trying to acquire the resources in East Ukraine. However, that decision can only be made with bad info. Like, it's very obvious that if that was actually their belief that they could have taken the East Ukraine and everything in like, in like a week or whatever, that like Putin was incredibly high on copium.
Because it's not just that Ukraine has received a massive influx of aid from the rest of the world, which they have. Um, it's also that Russia's military was like in a pathetic state when the invasion was conducted. It seems like this confidence could only have been inspired by a really naively optimistic view of your own country's like actionable ability to successfully conquer Eastern Ukraine is surrounded by yes men and stuff, which kind of goes back to the madman theory because functionally the difference between a madman and a person operating off bad information, sometimes there, there's not much of one. Um, Sorry, SDL, I'm not reading a whole goddamn wiki article right now, but I probably agree with you because you're reasonable. On my radar just a few weeks ago, and the quote, real motivations behind this war are anybody's guess at this point. But if you think this sort of materialist analysis has some weight, you can see how focusing on Putin alone might pose an issue for the future. Once Putin is gone, that is, if, if Putin is gone, the economic relations between different countries in Europe and within Russia and its oligarchs will not disappear. Russia could just, like, open up trade with the West and stop being weird. <laughs> Guys, like, I understand this is very much a forehead statement, but I genuinely feel like if Putin left, another more competent, less crazy fucking oligarch got in charge, and he was like, all right, listen up, we're going to chill the fuck out with our crazy hypernationalism." We're going to work really hard on uh, maximizing the profit that we get from resource extraction like oil. We are going to open up trade relations and diplomatic relations and stop threatening nuclear war every Saturday. And uh, yeah, we're going to rebuild our country based off that. And then they did some like New Deal shit where they start like employing swaths of like, uh, you know, sl uh, swaths of slob squatting Adidas track pants youth in all their cities to start rebuilding roads and shit. I feel like that's a thing their country can do. I mean, you need to do that and you would need massive like the like anti-corruption work being done. But like uh, but it, it can be done. I'm just saying like Russia has land, people and natural resources. They're not going to be invaded by any neighboring countries because of their nuclear weapon stockpile. They're in a good position to to build a real country. But, you know, the corruption shit is the real. Yeah. Yeah, that, there, was a, there was a time when that was almost possible, but just not. Not now. You're being idealistic about something in the U.S. States. No, no, no. Look, I'm not saying it's going to make Russia a utopia. I'm just saying that Russia could reach par with, like, Estonia or something. Like, Russia could be, like, a functioning country as opposed to a shithole. That's what I'm saying. I'm, just, I'm not saying we're going to turn it into, like, a world power or whatever. I'm just saying, like, if you want... The, the outcome that I'm suggesting here is superior to whatever economic outcomes would come about if they invaded East Ukraine and took all the land and resources and stuff. That makes sense, Tempest. I'm sure there are a lot of, like, polar bears in the north or whatever. There will be a tense relationship between Russia, a country with an economy dependent on resources many countries are trying to make obsolete, and the rest of Europe, increasingly wary of the influence and economic struggle Tigers. Russia can create by turning off the gas. In that sense, while the character of Putin's invasion of Ukraine is entirely his own, the motivations that have pushed Putin into war precede him and any recent changes in international politics. He made the decision, an awful one, but the prevailing economic system and the specific way in which it was imposed on the post-USSR countries, with highly concentrated economic and political power in the hands of a few oligarchs, created the conditions in which Putin could make his decision and hope for it to be a good one for his economic interests. Really awful economic interest at that. To summarize this whole video, personalizing this conflict and- Um, this has been a pretty good video. Making it about I Putin think. makes sense in the short term. Over the long term, it doesn't become irrelevant, but it isn't nearly so central. Putin and the Ukraine-Russia war can therefore also be seen as a warning call for other countries with increasingly monopolistic capitalist economies and political systems prone to autocratic co-optation. When the scramble for resources begins, a network of genuine solidarity between ordinary working people has the best chance of staving off war. The same can't be said of a global network based on maximizing profits and national competition with a handful of all-powerful people calling the shots. We can make pragmatic decisions in the short term, but should never lose sight of that fact. For what it's worth- Sorry, let me catch that again. The same can't be said of a global network based on maximizing profits and national competition with a handful of all-powerful people calling the shots. We can make pragmatic decisions in the short term, but should never lose sight of that fact. For what it's worth, I don't think Putin is crazy, but I do think he's been in power a long time and has grown accustomed to doing whatever he wants, regardless of what his advisors have to say. 
Finally, as a last addendum, don't try to use bits and pieces of this analysis to justify any sort of imperialism, whether that's whatever Putin's Russia is doing or sending Western intervention into Ukraine. There is no justification for the violence we've seen and for calls to escalate. We can understand the motivations and economic context okay. that has made our current situation more likely without falling into deterministic thinking, that is, assuming all this was destined to happen, or believing these actions are justified. They are not. War isn't a spectator sport as the internet would have you believe. It's not a Marvel movie with clearly defined good guys and bad guys. We should not be rooting for one army to massacre another. Those soldiers don't stand to gain anything. Yes, we should. ...thing from this conflict. They're normal people just like you and me. The only people who will come out on top... Well, the Ukrainian soldiers absolutely stand to gain from, from, from winning against Russia now. Significantly. I know what he's trying to say, where, like, neither of them stand to benefit from the conflict as a whole, but now it's a self-defense thing. Up ...are those at the levers of power of the bloodthirsty imperialist nations. All we should be calling for is for this conflict to be resolved quickly, without a ransacking of Ukraine, without nuclear weapons being detonated, without the expansion of NATO, and through- <laughs> Why? 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 We aren't, we're not talking about NATO the whole video, and then at the end we have to, we have to throw it in there. Through diplomacy. No war, but class war. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to help me produce right, more it's, content. Like, there are some parts here that I disagree with, but there's, this is not nearly as bad. Not nearly as bad as I thought it would be. Um, editors, you can put that in the, on the second channel. I feel like I said enough. Yeah, you can.